Okay, great. So welcome everyone to another expert series. Uh, we're here today with Paul Ratcliffe, who's head of digital at KCS. Hello, Paul. How are you? Yeah, really good. Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, very well. Thanks. Can you just give us this really brief overview of your role currently at KCS and what does KCS do? Yeah, absolutely. So, so KCS sell um, so products, consumable items, furniture, um, and sort of a raft of goods to education establishments, nurseries, businesses, organisations. So it, it's a really wide sector and, and uh, wide remit. Um, my role covers e-commerce. E um, specifically but also sort of other areas of digital marketing so sort of starting to look into so that kind of what we can do with social um, email marketing seo ppc etc so broad, it's quite a broad role broad definition but kind of at the moment we're focusing very much on e-commerce from yeah okay oh fantastic and uh just before we started recording uh you were saying things are quite busy at the moment with um with a lot of deployments and uh i thought maybe that would be a good place to start um just in regards to deployments and, and testing, is that right? Are you having to do a lot of testing? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we're obviously going through the upgrade cycles that everybody has to go through. It seems that we're getting to that time of year again. Um, so for us, um, it's been sort of a fast and furious few months uh, of looking at how we can sort of make the systems more robust, how we can sort of upgrade what we're working on uh, and, and ultimately just sort of continue to improve the customer experience. We're very much trying to get as close as possible to our customers and sort of what, what their expectation is when it comes to sort of ordering and shopping online and, and sort of how we can enhance a proposition that's um, been relatively stable but quite stayed for a little while. So looking at sort of what we can do in that. So no, it, it, in line with sort of the, the sort of usual upgrades and sort of security and support and um, we're, we're looking at what else we can do to enhance that journey. So it's certainly been busy, yes. Well, yeah, oh, fantastic. And um, yeah, we, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we, uh, yeah, we recently completed a research project um, interviewing, you know, the leaders of e-commerce, uh, the heads of e-commerce of, uh, retailers and yeah the the upgrade path of adobe magento seems fast and furious um there seems to be a lot of challenges around how to manage upgrades you know whether or not to keep up up to the the latest uh the latest level or to stay back a few levels um, what are your general thoughts in in regards to upgrades and how best to kind of like manage those. Yeah, I mean, it's a topic you could talk about for hours in its own right, isn't it? But 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 really, um, to keep it sort of short and succinct, I think for me, what I've learned is to try and um, have as robust a long term roadmap as possible. And obviously, that's easier said than done. But I, I make certain assumptions that, that there is going to be an upgrade, um, and I pre plan resource. I, I pre plan. Um, and have pre-approved any, any budgetary or resource requirements we might need in an assumption. If, if that's not used, then obviously we, we look to redeploy. But um, I, I've learned over time how important it is to plan. And that might sound the, the simplest piece of advice you can give, but I think far too often these things can come out of the blue. We're, we're, everybody's busy. Um, when you work in our world and in our environment, um, everything moves incredibly fast. And, and th these things, we well, know you know they're coming, they can sneak up. And before you know it, um, something else has gone in the way and you're suddenly two, three, two, three versions behind. Um, so for me, it, it, it's priority one when we're looking at our sort of 12 month roadmaps and we're looking at what, what um, is going to happen on an annual basis. Um, we will always put sort of the upgrade path at the forefront and, and, and assume that it's going to happen and then look at how we handle that alongside other projects. So, um, yeah, it's just about robust planning, having the resource already in place and making those assumptions that it's going to happen. Um, and then obviously as a team, we, we work with our sort of internal and external partners to, to understand um, what the upgrades will actually give us, what there is on a security and a support level. So what can't, what can we afford? Sorry, what can't we afford not to do? So what are we going to have to do and what are we going to have to, to put in place here? But also then sort of if you're looking at the sort of more the functionality deployments and, and sort of what, what, what new what new is coming out, um, could we leave that for a while? Is it best to leave it to be um, improved and optimised over time? Do we have something bespoke in place already that will cover it? So um, it, it's balancing the, the functional versus the, the must-haves. 
um, and then putting that into a timeline as far as far in advance as possible, um, and everything having everything aligned and in place for when it does come up. Something that came up in the research a lot was that uh, some companies are struggling to know what exactly is coming out with the upgrades. And, uh, you know, like there's so many different features. What is relevant to their business? How do you, yeah, how, how do you get a better feel on what features are being released that are relevant to your business? How are you able to do that? It, it, again, it, 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 there's a few different answers here. And ultimately, we rely, we rely on sort of our own in-house expertise. We rely on our agency partners. Um, we've got sort of informal networks and formal networks, sort of, sort of advisory um, partners and um, sort of colleagues who work with us to understand that. We've got um, solutions architects, analysts, etc. So it, it's a mix of in-house and out-house. Um, we also um, obviously broad brush, but but just keep our finger on the pulse uh, from the point of view. Um, we keep our kind of Adobe and um, sort of platform partners close to us uh, from a hosting and, and, and sort of platform point of view. Um, so yeah, so there's not sort of one answer. I don't have sort of one one fit solution, but broadly speaking, it, it's just around um, keeping in touch with as many people as possible, um, not pigeonholing ourselves into to one specific corner um, when we're looking at what's coming out um, we, we try and um, speak to as, as many people in as many different industries as possible to understand it um, and it just gives us a broad understanding of, of what's coming up obviously nobody has a crystal ball that's the only that's the only problem no great and um, just changing subjects here uh, where do you go for like UX inspiration and you know how are you keeping UX fresh and aligned with your brand it's a really good question um, it, it used to be so. It's it, it, it's an interesting industry um, and market that we work in. Lots of obviously largely B two B, and I think traditionally and historically, um, many people in our in our sector sort of looked inwards um, and just looked either to replicate what everybody else was doing or um, to, to just keep things as simple as possible um, or as they had been. Um, I think what what we try to do is, is get. First of all, get closer to the customer, so actually to understand how their buying habits and behaviours are changing. And I think more and more, uh, and again, this, this won't be a huge surprise, but looking at sort of consumer expectation and how that's changed. So as opposed to just looking at how we've always worked and, and sort of how do you optimise that, it's actually looking at how um, e-commerce habits outside of the industry are changing. Um, looking at, obviously, uh, this is... Um, an easy example but looking at how your Amazons are working and, and what they're doing for example what can we take from that and apply to our market um, we, we work with customers so forums and work groups to understand actually um, what impacts are is technology having um, how are their uh, habits and their their day to day um, work patterns changing and how can we align with that from to, to make their experience of working with us as, as simple and uh, as easy as possible so sort of largely looking out into the wider world um, and trying to broaden our horizons outside of what um, sort of we have always done and then looking at how we can implement that. So, yeah, really, it, it's looking sort of outside our sector and looking at um, what some of the big players are doing, uh, sort of, for example, sort of fashion brands, which have nothing to do with what we do, but how are they operating in our space and what are they doing and how can we utilise that technology? Uh, yeah, no, great. And you sort of touched on that you talk, you're close to your customers. So is that like a formal process of research with your customers? Like how, how do you get the insights from them? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's more informal. Um, it, it, it's sort of, it's very, very close to our heart as a business. So, so there, there are sort of formal research, formal, more formal research pieces. Um, but a lot of what we do is informal. It's conversational. Um, it is actually just going and sitting down and understanding and I'm, I'm watching how they work. So it is actually going and sitting with the customer, talking through their process. How do you place orders? How do you want to work with a supplier um, and, it, and it's more it is more conversational um, and then we take that back and obviously then apply into something that, that's slightly more formal has more structure to it um, things like focus groups and work groups obviously um, and then utilizing customers in testing so if we do have a piece of functionality we want to try we're going to roll something out we actually get the customers involved as early as possible to make sure it's working rather than making assumptions I think it's too easy to assume something's going to work or it's going to fit in with how they want to do their business um, so it's just for us around um, getting them in as early as possible so some of it's formal some of it's informal but it, it 
kind of whatever we do, we try and sort of bring the customer in at the earliest possible opportunity. Yeah. Okay. And so say like on the UX or the, a new feature, there's something that you want to bring in. Um, yeah. How would you, uh, how do you brief like your e-commerce developers? So we, we have some broad speaking sort of workshop sessions. Um, we work both sort of in, with internal teams and external teams, um, try and get as many people around the table as possible. And really it's sort of an open session, um, which then becomes more formalized as we go through. So yeah, we have um, sort of solutions workshops. We bring the customers into those. We obviously bring the research that we've done, all the conversational elements that we've done in um, into briefing documents. But again, try and keep it as informal as possible. I think a lot of what we do, and it sort of comes back to the agility of the platform and the upgrade patterns and everything's moving constantly. I think some of the mistakes that I've made sort of previously is trying to be too rigid um, and sort of inflexible. And I think for me, informality and keeping things agile is better so from a briefing point of view whether it's sort of internal or external we try and keep them discussion based um, and obviously we, we then brief in specific formal requirements and kind of a minimum expectation but you do keep our briefs quite wide and quite open um, and there's always opportunity or space to change something or realign something or add new or remove pieces of functionality that we'd originally thought were critical um, so really speaking yeah it, it, it's it's a relatively open process um, and it's just around collaboration. We have um, regular stand-up calls, regular conversations, constant communication through the process, um, uh, as opposed to sort of slipping in a brief and then leaving it until the, the development works uh, complete and then you test it. It's more about an open collaboration um, and just constant conversation. So try and keep it, try and keep it informal, try and keep it open, um, and just flexibility is key for us, I think. Great. And because um, you, you're working with an external agency as well as internal team as well, that's right? Yeah, we try and balance the two. So we've got a couple of um, sort of agency partners we work with as well as internal in-house teams as well. And um, uh, in regards to like there's a new feature you need to get developed, uh, do, you, uh, do you look for like a, an estimate on how long is it going to take or do you just like let them go for it? in regards to the time frame? Probably somewhere in the middle. Um, we always look to, obviously, for, for budgetary and resource purposes, we look for an estimate to start, um, yeah. as, as you sort of broadly expect, but always with an open mind. So it, it, it's never sort of fixed, I guess, um, because we know that something, as I say, sort of when we're briefing in, we try and keep it open. So we always know that there's going to be a, a chance that, that estimate will change whether it goes one way or another way, um, depending on what we come up with. So um, we will always try and get a, a, a rough estimate at least to start with, obviously, um, to have signed off and agreed, but in the knowledge that um, there is a likelihood that that could change. And I think ultimately um, we, every business has been caught short trying to fix to estimates in the past and, and you, you leave your show, you, yourself short. Um, because something took longer than you'd expect, so it means that you couldn't ha add in the final piece of the jigsaw um, when you needed it to. So again, it comes back to that agility and that flexibility. Yes, we will always get an estimate because it gives us at least kind of an understanding of where we, we should be looking in the ballpark figure of what we're looking for, but time-wise. Um, but ultimately, we have to take a flexible attitude because otherwise you, you just don't give the best experience to the customer. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm not sure how relevant this question is, but I mean, still, uh, you know, for uh, the external agency, I mean, are they aware do they have overview into the commercial realities of, of features being released? Absolutely, and I think we try and be as open as possible um, with anyone working with us on the development of the site. I think it's too easy to, to sort of lose that commerciality and the understanding of why you're doing something. Um, so I think um, it's more and more critical that anybody working with us um, understands uh, the the long-term impact of what they're doing. So a piece of work becomes less about fitting it to a timescale and less about um, the, the easiest, most time-tested approach. It becomes more about how it's going to impact the customer, how it's going to impact the business, and ultimately sort of how conversion and, and how the customer journey is impacted by what they're doing. So yeah, more and more, I mean, it, it's, it's reasonably recent, but I think more and more, certainly with our development teams, we're looking for a more holistic understanding of what we do as a business and why we're doing it, rather than just, here's a brief, here's 10 requirements, go away and build them for us. It's actually understanding what that list of requirements offers, what it's going to offer to us and also the customer um, and what the impact of that might be. Because then I think you get 
far more from the teams you work with. Someone might have um, a, a brilliant piece of input that they can add in um, that they wouldn't have otherwise have been able to. So yeah, to, to, to answer the question, it, it is relevant. Um, we're certainly looking to to broaden the horizons of everybody we work with and sort of bring them in to, to understand what we're doing and why. Okay. Yeah, because I guess if there's a large prioritization list, if, they, if they're aware of the commercials behind it, then uh, it's easier for them to... Exactly. And also, it, it, with the prioritization list, it also enables you to have an understanding of what impacts others. So you might be working on something and you think you can bring something else in, you can bring something we haven't thought of in. Um, so it just helps to sort of to, to widen the scope of what we're working on as well, as opposed to just running through the list and ticking boxes. It, it just, it, it, say, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a buzzword, but that holistic approach, it, it broadens an understanding of the sort of the wider piece that we're doing as opposed to just individual tasks. Uh, through the conversations that we had, we, we noticed that, um, you know, deploying new features, there's sometimes often bugs pop up uh, and there's a lot of a testing, you know, quite a large testing phase. What are your general sort of thoughts or advice in regards to you know streamlining the whole deployment and testing phase? Um, we've just uh, again, um, so apologies for repeating myself. We've just had to become more agile and flexible. I, I think previously it, it was very rigid, and I, I don't just apply this to now. I think sort of it, it, talking more broadly, but. Um, that testing and deployment schedules were extremely rigid. They were fixed. Um, if something failed, it would all move back. Um, the whole the whole project would shift. I think for me, it's become more about being pragmatic in our approach and understanding. Could okay, th- th- this isn't working as we expected it to. Um, what can we drop? What can we still push through? Um, it's about working internally and externally, and sort of it comes into that roadmap. But what are our options here? And if something's got to shift. Um, what 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 could we still push so it's about agility and pragmatism as opposed to sort of the more rigid project um planning that um certainly i've been forced to to sort of go by previously and obviously there's there's pros and cons and there's always risks with deployments and um, certainly around testing and obviously we'd never um sort of go live with anything that wasn't fully tested and working um but what it has enabled me to do um is just become um just more fast moving um, and it enables us to roll out 10 things over a course of time as opposed to doing a, a mass deployment. Um, so we're looking to, to do um, potentially, for example, 10 smaller deployments over a shorter period of time rather than one mass one. That if it doesn't then work, gets pushed back. So just about agility, pragmatism uh, and being, again, more flexible. So, yeah, that's repeating myself slightly in the briefing piece, but I think as a team, that's, that's sort of how we're looking to work. No, great. And... Uh... Just yeah, before we started recording, we were we were talking about uh, you know your situation at KCS and how um, you had built a lot of uh, bespoke code uh, back when there wasn't as many uh, features available now from Adobe Magento, and and now you're going through the sort of through the phase of um, putting in more uh, off the shelf. Uh, is that the term? Sorry, off the shelf. Uh, Native, yeah, sorry, <laughs> more, yeah, more native uh, functionality. So obviously, it's it's easier to support. Um, just just in regards to companies out there in the market who are doing bespoke code, this is something that's come up a few times. Um, and then, five, you know, two years later, new developers come in, and there is a bit of a unpicking, f- investigative phase. Is there anything that can be done? when the code is being put in to speed things up for the future developers? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a, it is a really difficult one because obviously um, every piece of bespoke code is different. It will always impact different areas. I mean, in, in my previous experiences, um, I have likened it to sort of unpeeling an onion whereby you think it's going to be one layer, you do it, and then it's impacted three other things. I think for me, and I think we've sort of discussed previously, but thorough documentation is key, and I think that's... It, it should be the absolute basic um, the minimum that you get, but so often it's not. Um, I think knowledge sharing, good thorough documentation, um, and just that retention of sort of functionality impact um, documented somewhere is the absolute key. Um, because whether you're with whether you're working with the same developers, whether you're moving developers, whether you're bringing new new 
um, agency partners, for example, um, without something documented and with, without that on paper to start with, it, you're almost looking at um, sort of a black hole because you just don't know what's going to be impacting what. Um, and coming back to your previous point on how do you get estimates for jobs and things, it becomes almost impossible because you, if, if you are switching out and upgrading functionality, it, it's so difficult to, to understand how a job's going to take and a piece of work might take because you don't know what's going to be impacted. Um, so unfortunately, there's sort of no hard and fast answer other than that I've found so far other than thorough documentation, knowledge sharing, retention, and just making sure you've got as many people as possible that understand what's happened as opposed to one person keeping all that knowledge under wraps. And what are your views around bespoke code versus uh, native? It's become, um, it, it, my, my views shifted over time somewhat in that a, a, a while back we certainly, um, bespoke code gave you, um, gave you functions that other people might not have. It, it was easier to um, fit in with customer workflows and systems um, and it was sort of a better way to pitch yourself somewhere outside the competitive market. I think over time, um, obviously, as, as sort of native functionalities improve, the understanding of how a platform needs to perform from a sort of a, a, an e-commerce point of view, um, I, I've swung very much more in favour, I think, towards the, the sort of the native side, albeit I think bespoke um, functionality still has its place. I think the issues are um, just the size of the task to, to move one from the other. Um, so I think for me, looking forwards, I'd always look to use native functionality where I could, um, just as you mentioned, because of the support and the ongoing, um, the process to, to continue to optimise and enhance that. Um, but I wouldn't be averse to using bespoke code if it gave us something that was absolutely unique or that it wouldn't do. So my, my view on it has swung. I, I've moved from very much sort of being, uh, yeah, let's go bespoke and let's be the only people in the, in the marketplace to offer this, to, to very much more looking at the, the what can native give us and how do we work with that. Um, and then if you've got one or two absolutely unique pieces of uh, for features that are really going to kind of change a customer's world, then I'd absolutely put those in. But I very much swung more onto the, the sort of the native side and out of the box. Okay, great. And, um, you know, a, a constant thing coming out is um, it's very hard to tell how long a deployment or a new feature is going to take to get built and, and with the testing phase as well. How do you manage, you know, with projects if things are blowing out? Um, like, how do you manage to um, the expectations with the board? On budgets, how do you manage the expectations of the board on budget and timelines? I think we, we set expectations as early as possible. As we have these long-term plans. We, we, we understand what we want to achieve as far in advance as possible. Um, and I think sort of honesty and regular communication is key. So um, where on the one hand we have sort of constant communication with our developers uh, and development teams, um, that's relayed straight back the other the other side um, to the business, um, so everybody understands what's impacting what and where we stand. Um, I think it's just around setting expectations as early as possible. Um, we, if there are potential um, timing options, so it could take this, it could take that. Um, we, we run through the options so everybody's clear. We work to a worst case scenario in many in many respects. I.e., this is this is the, the latest possible time, or the the, the sort of the the the, um, the longest it will possibly take to to implement that successfully. Um, and then we work back from that. And it, it, again, it's just about regularity. It is about honesty, and it's about kind of keeping everybody um, up to date with where we are as often as possible. So there's no nasty surprises. Um, and equally, everybody understands when something's complete and where we move on and, and how that impacts the business. So just about regularity and honesty and clear and concise communication, I think. Okay, great. And um, with your team at the moment, I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts around hiring generalists who can kind of you know, sort of wear a hat in multiple areas or, or hiring specialists for specific areas? It's a good question. Um, and I think both sort of skill sets absolutely have their merits. I think for me, um, as a digital leader at the moment, um, I, I, I 
look more for specialist roles. Um, we, we've got very clear objectives. We've got very clear um, goals in a digital space. Um, and I'm looking for uh, and have specialist um, roles to help me achieve those. On the flip of that, what I am trying to do is then um, upskill and work with my teams to broaden their knowledge um, and broaden their remit of an understanding not to make them generalists as such but so that everybody does understand um, sort of wider than that specialist role um, not just um, for, to, to, for how each role impacts it from a from a technical basis but also for everybody else's development and their development and an understanding of sort of the digital space and, the, and sort of how technology works and, and sort of what we're trying to achieve so um yeah, I think um, for me, work mostly with specialists at the moment, but certainly from a development point of view, um, always looking to widen knowledge once we've got that role in. So is that like with your current team, like trying to look for an SEO specialist, paid search specialist? Like, is this, is this the type of specialisms that you're trying to find? Yeah, absolutely. Those roles, uh, as a really good examples of, of quite um, specialist roles that we, we might look to bring in house. Um, again, sort of we work with agencies and and sort of in that as well. But th those sort of specialist roles, absolutely. Um, but then once someone's in, um, to broaden their understanding of how the business works and sort of other areas. So although you might have someone in looking at SEO, um, we might get them to work for, or with social for a while to, under, to, to understand how that works and, and sort of the commercial impact of, of that. So although it won't ever be part of their day-to-day -day remit, it, it just broadens that understanding of the wider team and, and the technological piece and kind of, again, comes back to that holistic piece, but um, just so they've got a broader understanding of what we're doing. Great. And and what role does data play for you in decision making? It's probably the single biggest um, contributor to the decisions we make. Um, it, it's we, I make so it, it's it's a tricky one because obviously it, it depends on the quality of data that you've got and sort of wherever I've worked. Um, Data has always played a huge role in it. We're lucky that we've got access to, to sort of huge amounts of data um, now, and we use that in every decision we make. Um, yeah, I can't under I can't underplay how important it is, um, both sort of front end and back end, um, whether it's commercial. So we take all our decisions data based um, using sort of various pieces of analysis and information that we've got, um, and. It's probably the single biggest contributing factor of anything we do. And in regards to making decisions for future features, if there's not the, if say if it's a new feature and there's no data around that, is that more qualitative? Yes. So that comes back to the customer. Um, and although absolutely it's more qualitative, um, it does come back to, so if we think something that, well, this might be a good idea and that the customers will love it, um, it's around coming back to, actually sitting down and understanding how it might be used, will it work, how could it change. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's certainly more qualitative, but it's it, it's still a data-based approach whereby we wouldn't just run with something on an assumption, um, obviously. Um, it, it, it's ensuring that there's some real foundation behind it um, and that there's some real foundation behind our decision-making. So yeah, it, um, either side of the fence, um, we will always have some basis decision sort of on the data side, yeah. Great. And then I guess once that new feature is sort of rolled out, uh, it's about testing and checking the data on that specific, specific feature. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's about testing it as robustly as possible uh, and then sort of constant analysis and sort of just taking an approach to if something's not working as we wanted to or it's not converting in quite the same way. How do we how do we tweak and change it um, and then starting the process again? So, yeah, once something hit, once something is in. Um, that's just the start of the journey. So we base it on um, sort of good foundations. And then once it's in, um, it's sort of constantly analyzing and checking and, and seeing how it's actually performing. Just last clarification, is that done on a subsection of your users? Like when you release a new feature or is it just like, um, yeah, to the entire user base? It depends on the feature and it depends on the, on the functionality. So some and some, sometimes it's subsection, sometimes it's broad. All right, fantastic. Well, I think, uh, yeah, we've come to the end of our questions. So. Yeah, that's that's everything. So yeah, thank you very much, Paul, for joining us. Not a problem at all. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. And uh, we'll be in touch. Great. Thanks for having me. Cheers, Connor. Bye bye.